Our first history lesson in the series, The Sands of Time, evolves around a famous painter from the 1600s. Many of the most famous artists around the world are known by a single name. You have Leonardo, you have Michelangelo, you have Picasso, you have Caravaggio, you have Raphael. And if you're an artist, and let's say you died three, four hundred years ago, and yet people still know you today by your name, then I suppose you made it as a successful artist. Today's history lesson centers around another famous artist painter known by just his first name, the name Rembrandt. Rembrandt was born in the year 1606. That's 414 years ago. And without question, he's the most famous painter to have ever come out of the Netherlands. About uh, seven months ago, about half a year ago, my wife and I were blessed to do a cruise down the Rhine River over in Europe. There were five couples that were friends of ours who talked us into joining them on this cruise. And we really enjoyed it. Down one stretch of the river, uh, there were 80 castles on both sides of the river. It, it really was an enjoyable time. But the cruise embarked from the city called Amsterdam. And so we flew into Amsterdam a, a couple of days early. And one night, uh, we had, the first night, we had dinner with a couple that were originally from our church. His name is Wigel, and when he was like 20, 21, he was in this church, Shepherd Church, and he went off to Bible college, and then he went to the Netherlands, and he, he started a church, and today it's like the largest church in all of the Netherlands. And so we had dinner together the first night, we just again had an enjoyable evening. The second night, because Amsterdam, although a beautiful city, has some very seedy sections, and to be honest, the entire city smelled of marijuana because there's a marijuana shop like on every corner. I said to my wife, I said, honey, let's walk out. Let's get out of the city center. Let's, let's, let's just go like exploring. And so we walked for 25, 30 minutes, and we came to a, a plaza, a small plaza, and discovered that this plaza was called, it was called Rembrandt Plaza. And they had a statue of Rembrandt that was made in the year 1852. That statue is almost 170 years old. Rembrandt lived and had an art studio next to this plaza back in the 1600s. That night, it was kind of raining off and on, so my wife and I, we ducked in under an awning of a cafe, and we drank some coffee, and I ordered a big plate of hot, fresh, cut French fries. And we put salt all over there and had ketchup and drank coffee, and we just looked out over that plaza that night, uh, the Rembrandt Plaza. It was a delightful evening, just the two of us. And it was at that time, we're sitting underneath that awning looking at this plaza, that we decided to Google Rembrandt because we didn't know a lot about him. And we started to read his story, this brilliant, eccentric painter during the golden age of the Netherlands. Many of his 300 paintings we discovered were biblical characters or biblical scenes. And one of his most famous paintings, of all his paintings, was a painting called The Christ and the Sea. Some people call it The Storm and the Sea, but Christ and the Sea. It was painted in the year 1633. It's a large painting, absolutely beautiful, four feet wide. It is five foot two inches tall. It's the only seascape that he painted. It's considered a masterpiece primarily because of the contrast between the darkness and the light, you can see several disciples up front frantically trying to fix the mast and the sail. Jesus, of course, is in the back of the boat. He's been sleeping, and the disciples have just awoken him. They woke him up. And you can tell by Jesus' face that he's not too worried about the storm, there's one man just to his left. It's difficult to see unless you look at it up close. 
that one of his disciples has his hands folded in prayer, and he's, he's literally begging Jesus to save them. On top, Rembrandt painted one of the disciples. You can see by his face that he is totally frightened. You can see the fear on his face. One of the disciples is down, uh, down lower. He is literally throwing up. Uh, obviously, he is seasick. He has had enough. One of the disciples is just sitting there, resigned to the fact that they're all going to perish. And if you go back to the photo, it is truly a magnificent piece of art some 400 years ago. Now, this dramatic scene comes from our text today uh, at the end of Mark chapter 4. And what I want to do today is I just want to read this text, and then I'm going to tell you seven things, and I'm gonna, we're going to go through them as quickly as I can. But let's read this text, then we'll go back through it. Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37. A serious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, and again, Rembrandt painted all this in that painting. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and the Bible says it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The Bible says in verse 41 that they were terrified, and they asked each other, who is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? Oh, what a much-needed text for our world today. Before I go on, I just want to ask you, are there any of you who are frightened today? Are any of you scared today? Are any of you living in fear today? Are, are there any of you who feel as though you're about to die, as though you're about to go under, and you look around and Jesus is nowhere to be found? Well, I pray that today is the day where you move from a life of fear to having a life of faith. That's my prayer for you today. I want you to picture yourself. This is all oh, this is important. You can use your imagination. I want you to picture yourself there that day in Mark chapter 4. Imagine that you are one of the 12. You've been there all day with Jesus, watching him perform miracles, listening to his teaching, dealing with the great crowds, and all of a sudden, the sun starts to set. Everyone is tired, including Jesus himself. And what we read in verse 35, I want to go back through this again. That day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, and remember, you're one of them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. It's about an eight-mile journey across that lake. And in verse 36, the Bible says they actually get in the boat and they head out across that lake. My question is if you had been there, and be honest, you were there when Jesus was performing the miracles you're one of the 12, you're listening to him teach, it's at the end of the day and you're tired and Jesus is tired and he says, hey, let's go in the boat and, and get away from the crowd and go to the other side. How many of you would say, all right, I'm in, let's go? I, I mean, after all, it's Jesus, are you kidding me? He wants me to get in the boat and go across the lake with him? I'm, I'm, I'm the first one in the boat, if he asks. How many of you, be honest, would you have gotten in that boat that day? Well, we all would have gotten in the boat. Well, here's my first point of seven points. Number one, following Jesus does not exempt you from storms. Following Jesus does not exempt you from storms. This text is a perfect example that you can be in the center of God's will and still be subject to storms. They were doing exactly what he asked them to do and found themselves in a life-threatening situation. You know, we're always trying to figure out why. Why 
are we suffering? Why are we going through these difficult times? Why do we have to stay sheltered in our homes? How long is this going to last? Will I lose my job? And if I lose my job, how am I going to pay all my bills? This storm is so severe. Why is this happening? Well, some storms are decreed, and they're for disciplinary reasons, like Jonah when he ran from God. Uh, that was a storm. Some storms are a test, like with the story of Job, where God allowed the storm just to test Job. Some storms are a result of being persecuted because you're living for Jesus. Uh, there's, there's a result of being persecuted. That's a storm. Just ask Daniel or go ask Stephen over in Acts chapter 7. And some storms are just because we live in a fallen world. They just happen. There are many reasons. There, there are many types of storms for many reasons. And you might not ever know the answer of why. But what you need to note, number two, write this down is that storms are a part of life. Storms are a part of everyone's life. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 12, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Storms aren't strange. Storms our norm. I want you to say, whoever you're sitting there with, just say, storms are norm. Say that. Storms are norm. A storm doesn't mean that God doesn't love you anymore. A storm doesn't mean that God is angry with you. A storm doesn't mean that God is toying with you. Sometimes he may be disciplining you. He might be teaching you. He might be growing you. He might be testing you. And at times, storms just happen. The Bible says in Matthew 5, verse 45, that the sun rises on both the evil and the good, and that the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Sometimes storms just happen. What's important for you to hang your hat on is point number three, and that is that Jesus will be with you in the storm. Oh, yeah. Jesus will be with you in the storm. The Bible said in our text that a furious squall, that, that's, like a, that's like a seismic category five storm came up. And the Bible says the waves were literally breaking over the boat. And this boat, it's not an ocean liner. It's not, it's not like Pastor Tim's yacht. It, 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 it's just a small wooden boat. I mean, if you just stood up in it, you might fall over and these storms are break, the waves are breaking over this boat. And the Bible says that the winds and the waves, as they were breaking over the sides of the boat, the Bible says that it was nearly swamped. That means that the entire boat was full of water. It was about to sink. They were all about to die. And verse 38 to me is funny. I mean, the first line is funny. That Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. I didn't, know, I didn't know Jesus had a cushion. The Bible says that he was asleep on the cushion. Have you ever met someone who can sleep anywhere at any time? Don't people like that make you mad? Oh, yes, they do. Jesus was sound asleep while the disciples were all terrified. They truly believed that they were about to perish in the depths of that sea. So the disciples, in verse 38, they, they wake Jesus up, because he's back there sleeping, and they wake him up, and they said, asked him this question, don't you care? Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we drown? You see, they mistook Jesus' silence as him being unconcerned. We've all been there, haven't we? You might be there right now. You're in the middle of a storm. You're in the middle of a crisis, and it seems like God is off somewhere taking a nap, like you can almost hear God snoring, like he could care less what's going on in your life. And because you think or actually believe that he's being unresponsive to your dire situation, you draw the false conclusion that God doesn't care about you. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus is in the boat with you. He's with you in the storm. He's with you in the crisis. What he's hoping and wishing is that 
what you have seen and experienced him do in the past would somehow provide a stronger faith for your future. If you know anything about the Bible, if you know anything about Jesus, you know that Jesus will never leave you and that Jesus will never forsake you. He will be with you through the storm. And you need to take this to the bank. And when I say take this to the bank, I mean take this to the memory bank, number four. Eventually, Jesus will calm the storm. Can somebody say amen? Eventually, Jesus will calm that storm. Verse 39 says that he got up and he rebuked the wind. And we know a lot about the wind here. He rebuked the wind and he rebuked the waves. He said, quiet, be still. And the Bible says that the wind died down and that the waves became completely calm. You see, there's one thing that I am certain about all storms, and that is that storms don't last forever. I want you to turn to whoever you're sitting next to and you tell them storms don't last forever. You say that. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Storms don't last forever. I want you to turn to whoever you're sitting next to and say these words. You tell them. Joy comes in the morning. Say that. Joy comes in the morning. Some of you are acting as though storms last forever. Storms don't last forever. Jesus calmed the storm that had frightened the disciples with just three little words. Quiet. Be still and calm the storm. Imagine if Jesus spoke a whole sentence or a whole paragraph. Imagine how powerful that would be. You see, God does not go by our timetable. He has his own timetable. He's going to calm your storms when he chooses to calm your storm. He has his own timetable, and his timetable is perfect. He knows and he understands and he cares about your situation. I'm going to say that again. Jesus knows and understands and he cares about your situation. You don't need to tell God how big your storm is. You need to tell your storm how big your God is. And if you were sitting in church right now, you'd all be clapping at that. God has this under control. Point number five. I'm going to tell you something that everyone already knows, but that no one enjoys. Point number five, write this down. Faith is developed in the storm. Faith is not developed in the calm. You see, we want faith to be developed in smooth waters. Faith is not developed in smooth waters. Faith is developed in rough waters. One summer, during a violent, violent thunderstorm, there was a mother who was tucking her small boy into bed. And she was just about ready to turn off that light switch when he asked the little boy with a tremor in his voice, he said, Mommy, will you sleep in my bed tonight? Will you sleep in my bed tonight? Mother gave him a reassuring hug and said, I can't do that, dear. I have to sleep with Daddy tonight. And after a long silence, it was broken by that little voice. The boy said, that big sissy. Oh, listen, storms frighten us, correct? Storms, they worry us, correct? Jesus, in our text, in verse 39, he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and, and the wind and the wave. it's completely calm. And then he turns to his disciples in verse 40, and he says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Pay attention to that. You still have no faith. In Luke's, Luke 8 account, he asks, where is your faith? And what I see in this text, Jesus first he rebukes, watch this, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and then he has to rebuke his disciples because they're exercising no faith. 
the amazing thing that most of these men were experienced fishermen. They had grown up on the lake. They had been in many severe storms, but this must have been the mother of all storms because they were all afraid and they all thought they were going to drown. And Jesus asked them this question. Now stay with me. Anytime Jesus asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. He already knows the answer to this question. But he asked a question in a true rabbinic tradition. For he asked a question in an attempt to get them to see and to understand a much deeper truth. Do you still have no faith? In other words, he's saying, you guys have seen me perform miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Isn't there anything in your memory bank of all the miracles I've ever performed that would lead you to believe that we're not going to be okay? You see, the real question he was asking is when did you lose your confidence in Jesus? When did you lose your confidence in Jesus? Can I be extremely, extremely transparent with you for just a a minute or two? Some of you listening right now have lost your confidence with Jesus during this COVID-19 season. Some of you are so afraid of dying that you're afraid to live. Some of us are acting as though this problem is way too big for God to solve. And in the words of J.B. Phillips, if you don't believe that God can calm your storm, then your God is too small. Many of us are just like those disciples in Mark 4. We are living in fear because of our circumstances. Your God is too small. You have lost your confidence in Jesus because the God that I serve is greater than any problem you're facing right now. Which leads me to point number six. Are you ready? Are you ready for point number six? Write this down. Oh, this is good. If Jesus is in your boat, you have nothing to worry about. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that good? If Jesus is in your boat, you have nothing to worry about. Listen, I can see those disciples. Remember, you're imagining yourself being there. They are scared out of their mind. Jesus is asleep on a, on a MyPillow.com pillow. You know they sell my pillows on the internet. And he was sleeping on a MyPillow.com Jesus pillow. You can look that up. They finally wake him up. He sits up. And he, he doesn't, the storm doesn't bother him. But he sees the lack of faith in all of his followers. And they're asking him, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? Isn't that a selfish prayer? Don't you care if we drown? Jesus looks at him like, did you guys really wake me up to ask me that silly question? Did, did you, do you guys really think that the boat that I am in is going to sink with me in it? I don't think so. You see today in uncertain times and unprecedented times and frightening times, if you're a Christian, now get this, if you're a Christian, Jesus is in you. He's in you. He, Jesus is not over there, and he's not over there, and Jesus is not over there. He's right here. He's in me, and he's in you. And if you have a Christian home, he's in that home. If you have a Christian marriage, he's in that marriage. If you're, in, uh, if you're being tossed back and forth by the turbulence of the storm, he's in that turbulence with you. And if the waves are crashing over you right now and you think that you're about to die, you need to know that he's with you right now in the storm. Following Jesus doesn't incubate you from the storms of life, but it assures you passage through the storms of life. And as we prepare to close, I come to my last point, and thank you so much for listening, but I want you to get this last point because it's the most important point. Only in the storm. You have to be in the storm to truly understand who Jesus is. 
the Bible says that they were absolutely terrified. Guys that had been used to being on the lake, used to being in storms, were terrified. And after Jesus calmed the storm, even, watch this, even out, they weren't, they weren't only terrified in the storm, after he had already calmed the storm, they were terrified. And they asked this question, who is this? Who is this that calms the wind and the waves? Oh, I want to, I want to teach you something. You gotta get this. This is the first of three miracles, back to back to back in Mark chapter four. You have, you have the, the calming of the storm. The very next story is where Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. And right after that, he raises a girl from the dead. Back-to-back -back miracles. He calms the storm. He heals a demon-possessed man. And he raises a girl from the dead, proving that he, Jesus, has authority over creation, that he has authority over the demons and the spiritual world, and that he has authority over death. Oh, I ask you, who is this? Who is this? You want to know who this is? Colossians 1 verse 15 tells us who he is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, things visible, things invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things are held together. And if he can hold all that together, he can hold your life together, he can hold your marriage together, he can hold your family together. No matter what happens to you. I wanna go back to that Rembrandt painting for just a moment. That painting was housed in a museum in Boston, Massachusetts at the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum. And you're not gonna believe this, but in 1990, that's not that long ago, St. Patrick's Day, that painting was stolen out of that museum. There were two thieves dressed as police officers. There's a long story, but they were dressed like police officers and the security guards let them in. Those police officers then handcuffed the two security guards and they stripped that museum. They stole 13 pieces of art, totaling $500 million worth of art, including that painting, The Christ and the Sea. They literally went into the museum and they went over to the frame and they took out a box cutter and they literally cut the canvas out of the frame. And still today, no one knows where that painting is despite a 10 million no questions asked reward. If I were you, I'd be looking for that thing. But apparently, apparently the thieves valued the painting of the Christ more than they valued the Christ of the painting. Oh, it's a great story about that piece of art. There's a podcast called Last Scene. There's like nine episodes telling you how that crime was committed. But don't focus on the painting of the Christ. You need to focus on the Christ of the painting and what he can do for you. I close by telling you this. If you study the picture itself, I'll put it back up there. If you study it again, there aren't 12 disciples plus Jesus. That would be 13 people. If you look at the painting, there are 13 disciples plus Jesus. There's 14 people in that boat. Who is that 13th disciple? Apparently, Rembrandt, in one of his most famous paintings, he put himself in the boat. 
And if you doubt that, you simply need to look at the self-portrait that he also painted. It's him. Rembrandt put himself in the painting. As if to say that this story in Mark chapter 4, it doesn't really matter unless you put yourself in the boat. Yes, there's a storm. Yes, there's wind. Yes, there are waves. Yes, it looks bad. Yes, I don't know if we're going to make it, but if Jesus is in the boat, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer. God, I thank you for this sermon. I thank you for this story. I thank you for its truth. God, we're living in a very difficult time. Many of us still today are sheltered in our homes. We're still fearful. And we, we don't know what to do, and we don't know how it's ever going to end or how we're ever going to pay our bills, and what are we going to do about this, and what are we going to do about that? Listen, we just need to know that storms don't last forever and that Jesus is not over there, over there. He's right here. He's right here. He's with us. He's, he's in our homes right now. He's in this story. He, he's in this text. He, he's in my heart. He's here. We don't need to act like those disciples where we're looking around and we're scared and we got to fix all that. No, we just need to know. We just need to know. We just need to know. Jesus is in the boat. He's with me. Oh, I'm going to be okay. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know, I know that Jesus is going to take care of this. And I have absolutely nothing to fear. And Lord, I just want to pray your blessing. I want to pray your blessing. I, I just, on every listener in every home, in every apartment, no matter, no matter what our situation is, no matter how bad that storm gets, God, help us just to know that you're here. You're there. You're here. We don't need to worry about it. And I pray, God, that you would help this virus to go away as quickly as it came. I pray, Father, that you would help us to not live in fear. I pray, God, that you would help us not to lose our confidence in you, O oh God. What a great story it would have been had Jesus just woken up and seen the storm and saw the disciples and they all were there with confidence in him and he would have said, oh, ye of great faith. But that's not what happened. They looked at the storm. They thought they were going to die. And they turned on Jesus and said, don't you care? Oh, Lord, you care. Help us to know that you care, that you sent Jesus to die on that cross so that we might have everlasting life. God, help us to know that all the promises in the Bible are real and that those promises are for us, that you will never leave us and that you will never forsake us, that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the bread of life. You are the great I Am. And I pray for peace, God, that you would calm the storm, that you would speak those same three words over the circumstances of our life. Quiet, be still. And God, may we know forever that you are with us and in us, that you love us, and that you will be with us every step of the way. I ask your blessing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. And amen.